November 8th, 2019. Behringer announces their latest product, the TD3. The TD3 is a new Behringer synthesizer. It's based upon the Roland TB303 baseline synthesizer. The old Roland 303 was originally released back in 1982. And back on release day, you could pick one of them up for about just under $400 uh, United States dollars. Upon release, uh, the Roland 303 was pretty much a total commercial failure. It failed to sell well. Eventually, it was deeply discounted to clear off uh, vendor shelves. And it wasn't until much later uh, that the popularity for the uh, Roland 303 began to grow. The musical group Future kicked things off for the 303 when they bought a cheap used one and began experimenting with it. They discovered that the 303 made some pretty cool squelches and took advantage of this unique sound to release the uh, album Acid Tracks back in 1987. And thus, they birthed the acid genre. This new acid sound took off in the 90s, and then slowly over the coming decades, the price of the remaining 303s, you know, as they became less available in the wild, they started to skyrocket the price, leaving them out of reach to most uh, musicians. So therefore, when Behringer announced that the TD3 was going to be available for the price of 150 US dollars in 2019, it created a lot of excitement across the internet, but not all of it was positive. You see, the TD3 is a great example of Behringer's playbook. Many of Behringer's products, if not most of them, just like, are just like the TD3. Uh, are just like the TD3. They're actually cheaper recreations of other companies' uh, gear and hardware. And this strategy has made Behringer the successful company that it is today. Behringer is a major market player in the audio gear industry, as the advantage given to them from their company structure enabled them to sell these recreations at a lower price point. Now, Behringer supporters will champion the company for the ability to sell these recreations of rare or expensive gear at price points affordable the most. So why the hate? Why is Behringer so controversial? Critics of the company will point to a number of issues. They will suggest Behringer's ethics leave a lot to be desired. Others will classify Behringer's reverse engineering of other companies' products as intellectual property theft. Some report that Behringer products are not as reliable or built to the same quality of their competitors, and many point to the personal behavior and action of Uli Behringer himself as a reason enough to not touch their products. So let's take a few moments to dig into some of these issues, so you can make your own educated opinion about the company. So let's start with the history how Behringer came to be, and to do so, let's review the history of the man himself, Uli Behringer. So Uli Beringer was born in 1961 in Baden, Switzerland. He grew up in a musical family. His father was a church organist, his mother a pianist. Uli was introduced to the world of music when his mother, mother taught him how to play the piano at the age of four. He dipped his toes into creating instruments at the age of 17. He actually designed and created himself the UB1 synthesizer. And the, the story about how the synthesizer came to be is, is quite interesting because in his youth, uh, Uli spent much of his time in the various music stores and he was playing around with all the classic synths that came out in the 70s. But, you know, being a, a nerdy teenager hanging out in these stores with no money, eventually all, all the shop owners kicked him out of the store so he couldn't go to the store and play with this technology anymore. So that made him very frustrated. And the frustration that experienced, mixed with his hobby of reading do-it-yourself electronic magazines of the day, uh, led to him to build his own synthesizer, the UB1. And this was really the first step in towards creating the company of Behringer that it is of today. And according to Uli, uh, the UB1 got disposed of when they moved uh, to the moved out of the German office to their Chinese uh, factories. And so there isn't a lot of information or demos or pictures of it. There's a couple that I found. And there's a there's a um, he he mentioned on a form some of the uh, some of the features around it, but not not a lot of detail around it, unfortunately. But in 1982, Uli moved to Dusseldorf, Germany, to take up piano studies at the Robert Schumann Conservatory as well as sound engineering at the Flakonschule. I'm probably terribly mispronouncing that, so pardon me for that. But when he was studying sound engineering, the school only actually had two microphones available for over 200 students in the class. And to borrow uh, this equipment, you had to sign a list and wait about four months to receive uh, the, the engineering items you needed. 
And as a student, um, Uwe couldn't afford to purchase this equipment himself. And without the equipment, he knew he wasn't going to learn anything. So he actually started to build his own devices. And he was so successful in doing so, his fellow students took notice of his gear. And he also offered to make them uh, equipment for some extra money on the side. And to Uwe's surprise, the demand for this gear took off. And he started converting his apartment into a small production facility. And thus Beringer was born and Uli made the self-pledge to himself that he was going to stand up for musicians and make great equipment affordable so anyone can realize their talent. So the next stage of this whole uh, story is by 1989, Uli made uh, the decision to bring his company to the Frankfurt uh, Music Fair. And he could only afford a tiny like 10 meter space at the fair and his booth was, was pretty bare bones. It was, it was mostly put together of whatever limited supplies and scraps he could find in his production facility. And he couldn't even afford a hotel room for the fair. He basically had the, the slum it up with his friends in the basement. But the fair was a major success for him. Uh, and orders for Behringer products around the world started to flow in. And Uli actually hired his first employee. And the two of them were producing gear around the clock. And then, so while initially the Behringer products were made in Germany, you know, the gear he was producing there, he was ordering all the components from China. And therefore, in the 1990s, uh, Uli made the decision to move production to China in the effort to reduce production, comes, production costs for the company. So with the move to China... They actually started this uh, special factory, uh, you know, development, and it was, you know, it's either called Behringer City, sometimes it's referred to as Music Tribe City uh, and whatnot, but but it's all the same thing. So in, in 2002, Behringer actually completed their own factory, and they called it Behringer City or whatever, and it was in the Zhongshan, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, of China's Guangdong province, after it consolidated more then 10 separate production f facilities into one plant. And basically these eight buildings were all used to build all the electronics, speakers, guitars, digital pianos, and everything on site. It even had its own health clinic. And this strategy was different from most of his competitors. Most of the other musical companies would outsource this uh, manufacturing to third party manufacturers, bring all the circuitry or whatnot they needed from these third party, third -party manufacturers and then build it. Uh, Behringer's strategy was to build everything they needed basically on site, which was allowed them a level a greater level of quality control. And this this huge facility and it, it ships right to today ships out more than 2.5 products a, or 2.5 million products a year around the globe. Now, it's actually a rather successful story about uh, moving production over to China, but but it wasn't without incident. And then there was one small ish incident that that was a, a note back in december of uh, 2017 so about 100 workers at at behringer city um went on strike on the 6th of december to protest uh dangerous working conditions now about at why they did this is 80 percent of the workforce were complaining about dizziness headaches coughing weakness blurred vision since they opened a new factory at that a new facility at that time in, in september of uh, 2017 uh, they said that the production lines were sealed, basically meaning there was no airflow coming in the building, like all the windows were shut. And this was causing them to directly inhale the fumes from uh, the production. Uh, and, and which workers were suspecting was giving them these, uh, these uh, health effects. Now, in early November, a 38-year-old worker at the factory came down with a high fever and was hospitalized. After being examined, uh, the doctors uh, diagnosed him with uh, leukemia which is uh, cancer of the blood, I believe. And the workers brought in their own testing devices and discovered that the levels of dangerous chemicals like foramahyde were three to 10 times the recommended safe level in China. And workers then contacted the local work safety department on the 28th of November. And after an investigation, the government told the uh, workers on December the 4th that their suspicions were correct. Now, um, to these um, allegations, Uli actually posted some comments about it. And here's what his comments say. Hello, everyone. Since the media has picked up on the Chinese media legal case, plus the factory labor strike last year, 
please allow me to respond. In the spirit of transparency, I believe it is important to address and correct some of the misconceptions associated with these topics. It is also worth mentioning that none of the media outlets have ever contacted our head office nor myself for comments despite the fact that each of them claim to have done so. As you are aware, I am always reachable through social media channels and never shy away from these sensitive topics. Over the past 30 years that we have been in business, we've had a rather ambivalent relationship with some of the publishers and magazines simply because we have chosen not to advertise. The reason is simple. We don't believe in common and dishonest pay to play scheme where favorable reviews are granted in the return for placing ads. As you can easily see, some magazines chose to retaliate and do publish very biased and unfavorable articles and reviews. I guess we have to live of it. However, I've always believed that people are smart enough to see through this behavior. We believe that our customers deserve unbiased, honest and independent reviews from real users and those can be found on many trusted retailers websites. However, there are also honest publishers whom we have incredible respect for as they have chosen integrity over commerce. Since I'm not familiar with the Chinese media case in question, I will need to first gather all of the facts, especially as complex foreign languages involved. Please give me a bit more time and hence allow me to address the factory labor strike that happened the last year. First of all, let me be very clear that our factory called Music Tribe City has passed all environmental tests executed by a government certified lab as part of the stingiest occupancy permit process. Over 3,000 air samples were taken from all areas of the factory. Comprehensive results were published and made available to all our factory people. When we first moved into our new factory this year, the environmental test had not been completed. And a few weeks after our move, one of our engineering colleagues was unfortunately diagnosed with leukemia. While it is easier for more medically educated people to understand that cancer won't develop within a few weeks, panic spread among the people who believed the person's illness had to do with the new factory environment and the people decided to strike. During the environmental testing period, our people were allowed to stay at home while receiving full pay and after the results are published, operations immediately resumed. Neither were formaldehyde or other hazardous chemicals found as suggested by the media. While not mandated by law and contrary to what was published, we certainly covered the person's medical bills. Most important, we're extremely happy that our colleague is now recovering and will hopefully soon return. Who in today's world would not consider employee health and well-being to be the highest of priority? Only a safe, well-treated, and engaged workforce will care about your company and deliver outstanding results. We're taking employee health, safety, and environmental aspects extremely seriously, and hence we have been implementing many green projects such as electric buses, wastewater, and dust collection and recycling systems, etc. In fact, this is the exact reason why we built our own factory so we don't have to rely on third-party contractors like our competitors. We believe in making a difference when it comes to how our workforce is treated and the way we manufacture our products. We are very proud that we've been ranked number one employer by a leading and independent job portal. Our factory, Music Tribe City, is ranked in Zongshan as the number one most popular electronics factory, the number one most popular, most popular recruiting company, and the number one most employee caring company. Special thanks goes to all our factory leaders who work extremely hard to make a difference for our people. Everyone is invited to visit us in Zhongshan, and we're happy to show you around for you to meet our people. Our head of operations at Music Tribe City is Paul Coates, a British individual and the head of HR. And the people development is Dominic Kett, who originates from Germany. Both are exceptional and caring individuals who enjoy my full trust to look after our people in the factory. My colleagues and I will be more than happy to show you around. Drop by any time, and if you'd like to speak of an area of people on Music Tribe Facebook page, just contact them. We are certainly not perfect, and never will be, but I can tell you we're damn proud of our people and our engagement with them. And finally, I too live and work in Music Tribe City, hence we all breathe the same air. Thanks for listening and your great support. Uli. So beyond this specific strike and incident, and, you know, Uli's suggesting that, that the media reports where they said they, these findings and the work, you know, like the uh, 
the chemicals in the air were, were false. And, you know, this was from a Chinese publication. So, you know, being a foreign country uh, and, you know, being China, it's hard to, to tell for sure what happened there. But if you go by Uli's word, that there was never any chemicals, that this was just a misunderstanding and, and you know, a, a sense of panic because one, one of his employees unfortunately caught leukemia. You know, it was a new factory, uh, maybe some strange smells in there and everyone kind of panicked. I don't think we'll ever know. But beyond this one specific incident, I can't find any other documented evidence of any other major disruptions at, at Music Tribe City or Barringer City. So personally, I got to say that the decision and how the, they executed upon moving to China and it, it's been paid out handsomely for Behringer. You know, the cost advantages of producing in China mixed with the reduced um, research and development of only having the research base so they take other people's uh, gear and figure out how to reverse engineer them. They don't have to spend R&D on coming up with new products beyond the deep mine. I think that's one of their unique products. Uh, it's, it's been a lucrative and enabled the Behringer to actually start to buy up other companies and build up their product lines and expertise. So with this success, like I've said, they've been able to make some significant acquisitions over the years. So let's take a look at some of these. Uh, one thing to note here is it gets confusing. So there's Behringer and then there's Music Tribe. And so what Music Tribe is, it's a holding company. So basically Behringer started out with that Behringer company. And then well, when they wanted to start buying up other companies, it's not like Behringer bought them out, right? So they created a holding company. So the holding company doesn't actually make anything itself. It just holds other companies. And one of those companies is Behringer. So when Behringer wants to go buy another company, it's not Behringer that's buying them, it's Music Tribe. And they all fall under this Music Tribe. So that when you hear Music Tribe, when you hear Behringer, they're both owned by Uli. And so they're kind of one and the same, but, but uh, legally, um, Music Tribe is its own holding company and it owns all these other companies, if that makes sense. Anyway, so I, I looked through uh, the various acquisitions and companies. So it looks like, you know, in May 2000, um, uh, Music Tribe acquired Cool Audio. And then in, in 20, 2008, this Bulgaria, which is a guitar amp company, was established. Uh, it doesn't look like it was a buy, buyout. It looks like it's kind of a, a company that, that was created by Barry Jr. or Music Tribe to, to be specifically sell guitar amps. Uh, December 29, 2009 was big when they acquired Midas and Clark. Uh, 2012, they acquired Turbo Sound, and 2015, they acquired the uh, TC Group. So, you know, they, they, over the years, they've acquired these different companies. And by doing so, they bring in the expertise from those companies and also uh, the chips and whatnot. So as they buy more companies and they buy more, more uh, uh, technology, they can expand their product line and, and offer because they build everything in house and when they bring in these companies it, it allows them to to build more and and they're selling more products and so what you have in their favor is they're not really doing a lot of r d to, to spending on r d to, to build new products you're only spending r d on reverse engineering other products uh, they have this massive factory in china that produces basically all the parts needed themselves for uh, their various gear which allows them to cut down costs because if you have to go and acquire you might sell a product but if everything in that product is acquired from a third party well you're having to pay a premium to all those third parties for their products to dump it to your product behringer is pretty much building everything they need on site which drastically reduces their uh, their cost of building products and also um, that they're selling so many of them and they're building them the, the, that, that economy of scale allows them to to cut down on the price for so for example if you're making a boutique synth and you're only going to sell 3,000 of them, well, you got to sell them at a premium to make up your time on the research and development, your time building them, and your risk. Whereas if Behringer comes up with a TD3 and sells, you know, a million of them, I'm not sure, maybe 100,000, 200,000, um, you can, you can, that, that profit per unit can be a lot lower, yet you can still make as much money as those boutique guys are when maybe they're selling their synthesizers of a profit of 1,500, 1,000 bucks, I don't know. Anyway. That's, that's about it for the, uh, the company structure. So I'm not a lawyer or even close to an expert on the law. So I'm just going to briefly cover some of these uh, various lawsuits. And I wanted to cover them as I think the results of the earlier lawsuits against Behringer were a cornerstone of cementing their current business plan. And while the later lawsuits uh, Behringer has filed against other people, 
Um, they're they're kind of an important indication of Uli's personality. And I think some of these lawsuits reflect uh, back about some of the hate the company receives, various uh, social media and whatnot. Anyways, let's take a quick breeze over some of the various legal fun over the years. So back in June of 1997, Mackey was accusing Behringer of trademark and trade dress infringement and brought a suit against Behringer seeking uh, $327 million in damages. In their suit, Mackey had said that Behringer had a history of copying products by other manufacturers and selling them as their own. And the U.S. District Court in Seattle, Washington dismissed Mackey's claims that Behringer had infringed upon the Mackey copyrights with its MX-8000 mixer. Basically saying, hey, the circuit schematics are not covered by copyright laws. So that that case was not successful and, and Behringer won. And, and I think that was really what gave them legal go ahead to keep going with their business practice of uh, reverse engineering other companies gear and, and selling them as their own. And then so back in 2005, uh, Roland uh, Corporation uh, sued to enforce uh, Roland's trade dress trademark and other intellectual pop property rights with regard to Behringer's recently uh, released guitar pedals at the time. And in this case, in this instance, the actually the two companies came to a confidential settlement. So we don't know what happened, but that the, the settlement was in 2006. And I'm assuming uh, Behringer caved to Roland's demands as they changed their designs of their, gar, their guitar pedals. And then in 2009, uh, PV Electronics Corps uh, filed two lawsuits against uh, various companies under the Behringer Music Group or Music Tribe umbrella uh, for patent infringement and whatnot. Now, I can't really find uh, the results of this, but I searched around and the only thing I could see was one short article mentioning a judge uh, determined that the PV's case was baseless, but I couldn't find anything beyond that. But I assume if they were successful with their uh, cases against Behringer, I'd be able to easily see uh, some news articles on that. So it, it sounds like either that ended up in some sort of settlement or was thrown out by a judge at some point. So you've seen over the years that, that and then there's probably other ones that these companies, you know, Behringer will make a, a, a redesign, you know, basically a reverse engineer their products. And they're very, very similar. But uh, it seems like Behringer has found that, that legal narrow avenue to do just enough to avoid legal litigation against them that they're able to not not be hit by these big lawsuits or able to settle and the problem is too is they're they're so big so they can hire a big they, you know they probably hire a lot of lawyers that can review what they're doing and say yeah no you're good or no you're bad and also even let's say you're an independent guy and you come up with this really popular gear it's rather small you're selling you're making a nice little profit but it's rather expensive Behringer sees that, he's like, okay, well, let's buy one, we'll crack it open. Oh, yeah, I see what this guy's doing. Well, we'll, 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 we'll mix it up just a little bit, enough not to get sued and put it out there. Okay, so let's say I'm making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, these lawsuits aren't cheap. So if Behringer steals, no, I shouldn't say steals because I don't want to get a lawsuit. If Behringer <laughs> reverse engineers my design, am I going to have the millions of dollars to go after them in court? And there's no guarantee that I'll win. I'm probably just going to to have to eat it, and even even a bigger company too, like you know Roland, see maybe had enough money behind him to to stand up to him. But you know some of these smaller companies, you know the music business is you know depending where you are lucrative. But for some of these smaller players, they're they're not exactly giants, so they're not going to have millions of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to to follow up on these legalities. So um, that's just my thoughts on it. Anyway. Let's get let's get to some of the more uh, recent um, you know lawsuits. So I've titled it Behringer versus the world. So and that's why I'm like I should be careful what I'm saying here because Behringer has gotten quite sensitive about you know publications and online forums calling the company products copycats, ripoffs, clones, etc. So Behringer's take on this whole situation is follows. One needs to be crystal clear about the distinction between blatantly copying someone else's product and the principle of reverse engineering. Copying a product one-to-one -one is clearly illegal. However, reverse engineering is something that takes place every day and is accepted as part of product development process known as benchmarking. Now, because of this statement, Behringer hit a Chinese publication called Media Fan with a cease and desist order 
and they demanded that this this um, this uh, company this uh, publication uh, you know print print an apology for calling them basically ripoffs and copycats. And you know there is no sense of malicious co compliance here. Check out <laughs> check out their apology. It's it's uh, pretty funny. Now beyond this specific incident with MediaFan, where there was no litigation, basically they they said to cease and desist to, to MediaFan and said, hey, no, reverse this, knock it off, or we're coming after you of our lawyers. And MediaFan caved, well, somewhat. But but in two, 2018, Behringer and Music Tribe actually attempted to file a libel suit against Dave Smith's Instruments, uh, which is now known as Sequential. Uh, and uh, because Yamaha was classy enough to give them back their name, uh, not like Behringer with some of uh, <laughs> their uh, copyrights, anyway. Uh, and 20 anonymous forum users uh, for using for making what is referred to as false, defamatory, and libelous remarks about its clones of synthesizers, such as the Mini Moog and OBX, OBXA and the Sequential Pro 1. Okay, so although this lawsuit was directed mainly at the forum users on an online forum. I think it was Gear Sluts or something like that. Um, Dave Smith's Instruments was involved because an engineer who actually worked there was posting on these forums and, and, and saying some of these statements. So Behringer tried to sue them, but the lawsuit was dismissed rather quickly after the defendants filed a motion under California's anti-slap statute. And I believe what the anti-slap statute is, is like, it prevents companies from doing lawsuits to to silence critics. It's basically the gist of it. Like I said, I'm not a law, law expert, but that's my understanding. So I think there's protection in the United States, at least in California, that says, hey, just don't do that. Be, be smarter than that. And since that, that, that decision, I have not seen evidence of this behavior of, of these lawsuits against, you know, critical comments or, or you know, you know, slander. Uh, until well, that's until Behringer attempted a, another tactic uh, to confront a criticism of their tactics, and we'll cover that next. So Peter Kern is a musician journalist who has not been afraid to comment and report on Behringer's various uh, controversies over the years, and it seems his reporting, especially the articles around Behringer sending the season desist order to media fan seemed to trigger a nerve somewhere within the Music Tribe company. As shortly after these articles were released, um, the company, uh, Music Tribe, actually trademarked the, his last name, Kern. Uh, uh, so they actually went out and got a trademark to use the, his last name, Kern, as part of their synthesizer development, which is odd. But, you know, once they obtained this trademark, people are like, well, what are they going to do with it? It was on their, on their Facebook page. They started to poke fun at poor Peter with some of these uh, joke instruments, and here's a couple of them. And all these joke instruments were kind of flying under the radar. They're probably pissing Peter off, but whatever. Uh, well, that was until uh, they came up with a fake instrument called the uh, Kern uh, Cork Sniffer. Uh, check this out. So, as you can imagine, uh, this video uh, pissed a lot of people off. And at the very least, it's an extremely childish attack at a man just trying to do his job. You know, agree or disagree with Peter's uh, viewpoint. He's just trying to grind out some journalism and present his thoughts about these various issues. And here comes a corporate giant, um, you know, Behringer Music Tribe. And they're using his name to push out fake products. They're insulting the man just because he had the audacity to call out and report on some of the company's practices. Now, beyond this childish insult, it's a terrible look for the company, but, you know, even worse, the imagery on the current cork sniffer, you know, so it can easily be mistaken as anti-Semitic. And I personally don't believe this is what Behringer was going for with this thing. I think they were just purely trying to insult Kern and get under his skin. But regardlessly, that's the risk as a company you take for these stupid type of stunts. And, and for what benefit to Bering Jr. or Music Tribe? You know, at the best, you're going to make Peter feel like crap. Okay, so how does that help the company? You know, if you, you, you hurt his feelings enough that he just get say, you know what, I'm sick of this Bering Jr. nonsense. I'm not going to report on it anymore. Maybe that's a win. Like, but, but, but look, 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 you know, the most likely outcome when you do stuff like this as a company is you're going to piss the reporter off. And great. So then what? He, that reporter is going to be driven to continue to find the faults, you know, the controversies of your company, and do everything within his power to bring them to light. So once again, I ask, how does that help you as a company? 
But in the case of this cork sniffer, things went about as poorly as they could for Behringer. You know, Peter didn't even have to do anything. Behringer's own action tarnished their own brand and pissed off many in the music company. And the most ironic part is it gave a ton of positive exposure to Peter's work. I hate to say it, but the whole situation defines the term epic fail, especially for Behringer's PR. I'd love to know behind the scenes what in the living hell happened at Music Tribe to kick all this off. You know, I imagine really did he go to his you know, did he go to his uh, lawyers and demand that they sue him? And the lawyers like, yeah, you might not want to do that. That could backfire. So then did he go to his PR team and said, you know, we got his we got his name. Let's let's attack this gentleman however we can. And and so who came up with these ideas? You know, the possibilities are endless. But anyway, you look at this issue. It's a tremendous failure at leadership and strategy. You know, and by by doing nothing. Uh, many, you know, you know, they could have done nothing, right? They could have just taken the hit from, you know, Peter's articles. Uh, how many people read it? Maybe I don't want to just go against Peter's work. I think it's great, but but how much traction was he actually getting there? How many people were reading these articles? How many people knew about, you know, Music Tribe City? How many people knew about the strike? You know, maybe some, but 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 this brought it up to a whole new g generation of people, and you know, by doing nothing. Many who did not read, or read, or read Peter's work were ignorant to a lot of these issues, and and by by doing this by doing this stupid stunt, it, Barringer just hurt their own reputation, and it's just stupid. I'm sorry, and and you know, and the incident response from from Barringer wasn't much better. Check out this apology, and you know. For Uli to push it, push his own marketing team under the bus and not take responsibility for this incident himself, you know, in my opinion, was a was a poor choice of demonstration of leadership. You know, let's say, let's just let's just say this didn't come from Uli, and and it was some guy in his PR firm went rogue. Well, you there these 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 Facebook posts, it wasn't all in one day. They they came out like you would see that first one, and maybe go, what the hell are you doing? Knock this off. Well, like this is gonna helping the company, and maybe say, yeah, let's 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 stop this. But but you know, he threw his PR team under the bus. I'm sorry, you're you're the CEO of the company. You're responsible. Anyways, that's just my feelings on it. I'm sorry. It's just uh, it's just annoying. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just not good. All right. So how do we wrap this up? And it's an interesting question, right? Because not everything, just like everything else in life, it's not all black and white. There's a lot of good with the Behringer story, and there's a lot of bad too. There's a lot. It's 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 a mixture of gray. And you know, I personally find his story inspiring. You know, you know, growing up, getting introduced to music, getting frustrated that there's all this cool audio gear, and I'm never going to be able to afford to to pay for this stuff yet, and getting kicked out of the stores. You know what? Screw this. I'm going to start my own company. And people aren't going to have to pay thousands of dollars for pieces of equipment that actually only cost a couple hundred bucks to make. And I get it. It's actually a good business. And it is a good business plan. It's a, it's one of the biggest you know music companies in the world. And he's done very well for himself. So I'm not going to sit here and, and say Uli's an idiot and he's awful. Um, he, he's done a lot of good. And and maybe people will disagree with that statement. I can, I can understand how you can. Like... It's like you, you can consider like his his business practices not ethical, but technically by the lay of the land and by the lay of law and capitalism, he's not doing anything wrong. He, he's staying within those lanes and he's great. And by doing that, he's enabled a lot of people to get their hands on a lot of different audio tools that they may not have been able to do otherwise. And competition is never bad. Like the people buying a mini Moog aren't going to be buying a Model D. You buy that Mini Moog because it was handmade. It, the quality of it is going to be on point. Like you're, you're buying it for, for, for the experience of, of almost an artistic piece, let alone an instrument. Whereas when you buy a Model D, like I did for 250 bucks, you're buying it because you want that Mini Moog sound, but you don't want to pay $3,500 for it. And you're okay if it was mass produced in a factory. You know, you know it's going to be maybe not 100% the same sound as a mini mug. You know it's not maybe going to have that same reliability. Even though mine's been fine, and a lot of people say theirs are fine. And, you know, mine may drift out of tune. It's not you're you're not going to get that same quality that you're going to get for that 3,600 bucks. You're not going to get the same you know feeling for that. It's a two different products. But I 
as a as a hack and go down to my basement and goof around with a mini moog or a near mini moog basically now because of behringer's company and their products which is great and i'm glad people have that choice because the more choices we have as consumers the better and his story is inspiring but i think what we're what we're experiencing here with some of these lawsuits and some of this sensitivity to, to criticism is is i think is ego is Uli's ego is getting the better of him and it's really easy to understand like it ego is is very hard to control sometimes you know i'm good at a lot of things and i'm really bad at a lot of things and and it's easy to let to be a champ or really good at something and then think you're expert at everything and i think i've seen this in my career i've seen this in my personal life is there's some really super intelligent super talented people that are really good at some things but they let that blind them to things they're not really good at. That They build up that ego to the point where they, they've been so successful in this one area. They're so smart in this one area. They go, you know, I'm an expert at everything. I know everything. So I think, I think especially in engineer types, this is common. And I think this is exactly, in my opinion, what's happening with, with, with Behringer and Uli. Is, is you have a CEO, Uli, who, who basically stands alone. He's built this company from the ground up. Yeah, and and from that past experience of building this giant, he's going, well, why do I need to listen to anyone else? I know everything. I built this company up. I, I'm i right. Everything's good. And for 95% of probably his decisions, he's probably on point. But I, I think he might want to invest in a proper PR person and let that people have some control of the wheel. Because I think what's happening here is, you know, somebody will call his product a copycat and technically if by the rule of the law that's not true it's not a copycat he's reversed engineer it he's within the law so in his head with his intelligence he's going that's wrong i gotta correct this and and he's not thinking it fully through he's thinking i'm right they're wrong i'm gonna make sure they're proven wrong my company is up to you know i i, I have a well-established company i gotta maintain my my uh integrity here i'm going after these people and what's you know, if you're thinking black and white, he might be correct. But the problem is, by trying to push out lawsuits, going after journalists and people just trying to report on these things, he's doing more damage to himself than these other people are doing to him. And there's nothing that a PR, like really, when that his apology or around, or pardon me, his, his report back on the Music Tribe situation with the, with the, uh, with the strike, not bad you know he's like okay yeah no and then but but this this current cork sniffer you know suing a, an online forum that that gets wacky and that's when you start building up people looking at your company and go what am i supporting here and to be honest for me personally you know i probably would own more than the td3 i would almost canceled my td3 when um the that when i saw that current cork sniffer and i would have if, if i could like i already had the pre-order in and i I'll be fair. I, I didn't want to have to call up the company and cancel. I'm like, it's almost 150 bucks. But I didn't buy. I almost bought a deep mine. They they were on sale for you know 900 bucks Canadian. But I'm like, you know what? I'm not buying it. And uh, just when for me with how these incidents impact me is if I need the gear and I really want it and it's a good price point, I'm probably gonna buy Behringer. Like I'm sorry, but when it's in that iffy area like the deep mine, I'm like, I don't have a poly synth. I'm like, oh. Hey, this deep mind looked kind of cool, but I'm like, you know what? I don't need another synth. I don't need to spend 900 bucks right now, and I don't want to support that kind of practice. So I'm not sure how many other people out there think like that. There's probably a lot of people that are ignorant to all this, and that's fine. And there's probably a lot of people that are. I've seen it. I've seen it on the online, and I've seen it on my local Facebook group. Is people th throwing the Behringer headlines up there? Like, look at this crap. Why would anyone buy this? And they're 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 advertising against Behringer and they're making enemies by their their some of these PR actions, and ultimately it's going to cost them money. So I think one question for Behringer to ask itself moving forward is: Would these lawsuits, with these you know, with these stunts, how is it helping your company? Think it through a little bit more. And I hate to throw, well, you know, so here's a guy sitting in this crappy little house telling a multi-billionaire how to run his life. So take that as you will. But but I, I personally don't see how it helps them. And, and I think moving forward, uh, if they want to continue to grow and be a successful company, 
it might be time to grow up a little bit on the PR front and, and, and you know, make some more unique products to, to, to build up their status and be a good part of the synthesizer music community, which they are for the most part beyond these stupid little incidents. Ditch that stuff. Instead of doing that, how about some nice PR? How about, how about you know, bringing up some independent artists? How about, you know, investing some money into maybe getting your gear into you know you want to bring music to everyone and maybe they already do this maybe it's my ignorance but like look, why don't you donate some gear to to some schools and whatnot and, and you know set up programs like that instead of uh, going after independent journalists that's just my suggestion and and to be fair it's just my stupid opinion anyways i hope you learned something i hope you can make your own call moving forward the whole reason i wanted to do this was you know, when I when I stumbled across that TD3 article, I got excited because like, oh, this looks cool. 150 bucks for a synth and everyone loves it. I'll buy it. And then digging in, I'm like, well, why does everyone hate Behringer? Why is it? What's what's all this fuss about? So I kind of want to just put this piece together to cover that. Hopefully I don't get sued or, or have the Capron cheeseburger eaten of 1000 synthesizer introduced. Uh, but anyways, um, thanks for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you want more of these docs or whatever, let me know. Uh, I'm still finding my stride with this channel. So, uh, let me know what you think if you can. Uh, I appreciate it. All right, guys, I'll talk to you later. Bye now.